Hello, I am Jess saint Seguin and the team lead in Canada for the European Union project on reducing plastic waste. Welcome to all of you joining us today. As you may know, both Canada and the EU are pursuing ambitious goals to reduce plastic waste and achieve circularity for this widely used material. While these efforts are contributing to our commitments to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, connections and collaborations are more than ever necessary to tackle the challenges presented by this complex mission. The EU for foreign policy instrument is one way that the EU is supporting exchanges all around the world that can lead to innovative practices. The project on reducing plastic waste in Canada that began in 2021 is one such way. As part of this project, we are pleased to host a series of webinars exploring innovations and solutions to address the growing challenge um, of the plastic waste stream that is flexible plastic packaging. Our four webinars explore the path to creating a circular economy for flexible plastic packaging, and each webinar focuses on a distinct theme. Together, they cover the complex system of plastic recovery with a focus on emerging policies, strategies, processes, and technologies. Throughout the series, we're bringing you the leaders in Europe that are working to achieve circularity for flexible packaging. We are grateful for the time that they are taking to share their valuable experiences and insights on the innovations they are pursuing for flexible plastics, so thank you. We hope that you will learn, be inspired, and connect with others in the pursuit of your own efforts in this area. Let me introduce our moderator for today, Ms. Crystal Howe from Ice River Sustainable Solutions. Ms. Howe is the Director of Sustainability for the Ice River Sustainable Solutions Group of Companies. In 2009, Ice River began their recycling journey by starting their own pet recycling facility and have been producing their 100% recycled pet bottles ever since. In 2018, they ventured into flexible films by opening BMP Extrusion, and the team is now focused on strengthening the circular economy for flexible films by increasing the recycled content in their thin gouge collation shrink film. Crystal has champ championed many initiatives in the area of zero waste, circular economy, energy reduction, and manufacturing efficiencies to minimize the environmental impact and maximize the effectiveness of the business. Today, she brings to our webinar her extensive experience in the plastic recycling supply chain and deep understanding of operational and policy issues on this topic. A warm welcome to Crystal, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Jacinth. So I am pleased to be moderating this third webinar in a series that features the spectrum of advancements in the recovery of flexible plastic packaging. Our first two webinars featured how leading organizations developed comprehensive roadmaps for increasing the circularity of flexible packaging, followed by the systems and technologies that advanced the collection and sortation of flexible packaging. You can access the previous recordings and presentations from the first two webinars on our registration site. So going back to Ice River for a moment, when we first entered the PET market in Ontario, Canada, we found that we were one of the only ones that had a local draw for that material. It was going out of province or out of the country completely and overseas. So just by adding our consumption, our consistent consumption to that market, we saw increases in collection, uh, better sortation, better quality of bales, um, and, and the, really the price became something that made sense to, to put energy into. And once we put our bottle into the market, consumers started to realize what was possible and they started to send those market signals. You know, we want recycled content. The consumer is becoming a, a lot more educated on the, these things. So it's, uh, it's very exciting to hear what we're going to hear today. I look forward to it. Um, when we first started asking for recycled content in our flexible film, on the other hand, uh, in about 2016, we, we weren't met with the same positivity. Um, really, our suppliers said it's not possible. And why would you want to do that? And now to see what's happening in the market now, that collaboration from all different parts of the, the industry is really, really exciting because we know how quickly things can change. Today's webinar will explore how mechanical recycling technologies and facilities are adapting to recover polyethylene and polypropylene flexible packaging. 
Our dynamic speakers will be giving a firsthand account of leading pilot projects and advancements in the processes to recycle these plastics and what they're doing to meet emerging market demands. Again, those market signals are so important. Every new customer pulling consistent demand drives meaningful change in that industry. We will first hear from our speakers, and then I will moderate a question and answer period afterwards. At that time, I'll encourage you all to place your questions in the chat box on the right-hand side. So before we start to introduce the speakers, we're gonna go through some housekeeping uh, matters uh, about the platform that you're using. So there's going to be three present presentations, and then we'll have the Q&A after all of them have presented. The streaming of the event will be accessible in the sessions area on the left-hand menu. Once in the plenary, if you, the streaming is muted, you can go down to the, the mouse over the streaming area to change the volume at the bottom because it will be muted by default. Overall, if you're having any issues with the technical side, which I'm sure I would have, <laughs> you can go up to the top right hand and you'll see that there's a help desk and they will help you. You'll be able to chat with the technician. So on the right hand side of the plenary, you will see a chat and a polls tab. So the chat um, will be used, you can interact with participants and the organizers, and it will be opened to place your questions in there once, we've, once um, we've invited you to do that at the end. And then the polls tab will be used at the very end for a quick evaluation of this webinar. On the left-hand side of the menu, you'll find a speakers tab. So if you click on that, you can learn about the speakers and you can check their bios. And you'll also see a resources tab. You can download the presentations from before this webinar um, and other relevant resources that may be made available to the participants. And then the recording of this webinar will be made available after the event. So I will start now uh, by introducing our first speaker, Dana Masora from CFlex. She is the founder of Dana Masora Consulting, a company dedicated to driving the circular economy for plastics packaging and works as a consultant for the European C-Flex Consortium. Dana has a broad professional experience ranging from applied research in cosmetics to consumer marketing in Colgate Palmolive and Sara Lee in the US and Europe, and the plastics packaging value chain in Europe and Africa. With Dow Chemical between 2007 and 2016, she led the value chain engagement for the European division of Dow Packaging and Specialty Plastics and eventually headed the European, Middle East and Africa sustainability and advocacy initiatives for the business. As a legacy project, she created in 2017, the ASASE Foundation in Accra, Ghana. The foundation is helping entrepreneurial women from underprivileged communities to start social enterprises in recycling plastics packaging and diverting it from urban and marine litter. Over to you, Dana. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm speaking here today on behalf of the CFLEX Consortium. Uh, so allow me to uh, go uh, in my presentation first through uh, introducing CFLEX, who is uh, what's the mission, the vision, but then I'm going to focus on a particular project which uh, really evolved from a CFLEX key deliverable on the roadmap for a demand-driven circular economy to a full commercial scale uh, demonstration plan to be built. So uh, let me start with CFLEX. Uh, we are a consortium which has been um, um, established back in 2017, we started at that time with 20 stakeholders, uh, all wondering if circular economy is a, something which is here in Europe to last, and how are we going to address all the challenges related to flexible packaging for the circular economy. We are today over 190 stakeholders. Um, representing the entire value chain of flexible packaging. And um, there where CFLEX really innovated is by the fact that it brought around the table the entire value chain, including the end of life management. So if you look at the combined global turnover of the stakeholders, which is uh, over 1.3 billion euro, you can understand the 
power to drive change on the market in the industry toward the secret economy of this consortium. Um, I can share some other numbers like uh, we're really in Europe employing over 500,000 people. In over 5,000 locations, more than 1,800 being uh, manufacturing locations. So our vision is for all the flexible packaging to be collected in such a way that over 80% of the materials will enter into a recycling process and will be returned to the economy to replace fossil-based virgin materials. Obviously, um, against this um, vision and with this mission, we are um, managing a certain number of projects which are all technical based and meant to deliver on the vision. So um, I'm going to start by uh, introducing to you um, a concept with we in CFLEX are considering central to everything we do. Uh, we believe that for the circular economy to be realized for flexible packaging, we have to call for a demand-driven circular economy. What this means is that we are always starting by the question, what type of packaging, what quantities, what type of materials are entering the market? After that, once the waste is being reprocessed to become recycled material, where can it find a place in what kind of end market for what kind of um, content of recycled material in this end market? Are these end markets sustainable? Are these end markets matching the um, requirements or their requirements are matching the uh, type of properties which the recycled material can deliver? And from these basic questions, we're starting to think about which are the recycling pathways, meaning what type of recycling technologies are needed to be implemented throughout Europe, such as a link between what enters the market and what will find its place in the markets can be made. Related to the recycling pathways, we're looking into what type of sorting capabilities and capacities are needed for Europe in order to realize a circular economy, and as a consequence, what type of collection systems have to be put in place. The fact that today the circular economy is not yet well established, or you might say realized, it's showing that the market does not function yet and the systems are not yet in place the way they should be. So we're looking at other enabling elements like design for a circular economy guideline. Uh, extended producer responsibility and legislation as ways to um, help the implementation of the right, not only strategies, but solutions to the market to drive this circular economy. So in one of our early position papers, we had established that to drive the circular economy for flexible packaging, uh, the industry would need a range of technologies because the key priority for CFLEX is the full material circularity. So all the materials have to find their way back um, into an end market. And this is why, and recognizing the fact that a large percentage of the um, end market demand is characterized by the need for food contact simply because flexible packaging is largely uh, dominated by food packaging. Um, the complementarity between mechanical and chemical recycling is a must, and it's something which has to be enabled to be realized. The other thing which we had already brought to the market as a deliverable um, on the roadmap towards the circular economy, um, as CFLEX, are the design guidelines for a circular economy. So um, a little bit more than a year ago, we had published the design guidelines for what is more than 70% of um, um, flexible packaging in volume. And I'm talking here about the either monopolyethylene or monopropylene 
type of packaging or the uh, polyolefin base, which would be a combination of these two polymers. Um, so the guidelines are there. You can download them if you are interested from our uh, website, uh, which you are seeing um, uh, listed on this uh, slide. Let me now focus on what I called uh, at the beginning value flags, um, a key project a flagship project um, which we're looking forward to realize in Europe. So Bioflex started with a, uh, another key deliverable of um, a C-Flex, which is a quality recycling process. This is an innovative combination of existing technologies in recycling, which has been uh, brought, put together by a um, collaboration between different stakeholders in CFLEX, meaning different companies um, which are sharing the same preoccupation and the same goal. How can we recycle more and better flexible packaging? So the quality recycling process is a sequence of the following four uh, processes. Uh, number technologies, I'm sorry. The number one is uh, enhanced sorting, uh, which is using um, near infrared technology and um, visible infrared um, and in essence it enables the um, sorting of polyethylene or polypropylene at very high purity and quality followed as a, a technology by um, hot washing which is in addition to cold washing for better removal of residues including organic residues and um, other things like uh, some of coating, some inks, um, and certainly fibers, so papers. Followed by extrusion with extrafiltration, which will help remove volatiles and non-target polymers. Um, if you talk about polyolefins, therefore PET or, or um, PA or um, for that matter, metal. And at uh, the end of the process, the odorization for um, complete or almost complete odor removal. This um, so-called QRP process became of interest and central to ValueFlex as a technical project. And it has been proved through extensive trials together with stakeholders, also stakeholders from CFLEX, which took the polymath resulting from the process and developed applications like collection shrink, pouches for non-food application labels, which can be used in bottled water because they would not be in direct food contact, for instance. Um, in the same time, uh, the business case for the implementation of such a technical concept has been proven through a collaboration with University of Ghent um, and obviously backed up by uh, a lot of data collected throughout the uh, project development as CFLEX. Now, how did it become uh, ValueFlex and what does it mean? It really became ValueFlex when CFLEX started a partnership with the Alliance to end plastic waste. At the moment when the Alliance was looking for flagship projects for Europe, which would help address the key challenges for the industry. So the Value Flex project aims to um, realize a full commercial scale demonstration plan, which would demonstrate the business potential for a project which will maximize the value capture from recycling of all polyolefin based household flexible packaging at scale. What we demonstrated as CFLEX at experimental um, or semi-industrial would be now demonstrated at commercial scale. Um, really, we are targeting to do this by the, the uh, realization of a valorization of the full um, flexible packaging PE and PD, so polyolefin based, um, using complementary outputs which range from mechanical recycling film grades in both polypropylene and polyethylene. Um, and by the way, polypropylene, it's, it's um, a first coming from this project. Um, then grades which will be um, targeted for injection molding, thermoforming, extrusion blow molding applications, 
And um, once this kind of market demands would be fulfilled, then the polyolefin mix uh, can be uh, sent to chemical recycling because it will be of the type of quality which will maximize the yields in chemical recycling. The design of such a plant, it's meant to be done in a flexible uh, way, uh, with a flexible concept, such as the mix of the outputs, as I just described, can be adjusted on the base of the market demand. In other words, if the market at a certain point in time would request more film grades, then the plant would produce more film grades. And in the meantime, if um, the request would be for chemical recycling, then the plant would be able to send more to chemical recycling. Um, so this project, um, it um, actually had finished its assessment phase on both technical concept and business case by the consultant hired by the Alliance, Roland Berger, who is basically um, um, confirming the validity of both technical and uh, economical uh, case for the project. So we are moving now forward towards uh, the launch of a bid uh, for the construction of the demonstration plan in Europe. In conclusion, what I wanted to pass as message here is that if anyone still doubts today that flexible packaging can or cannot be truly circular, the answer from CFLEX is absolutely yes. Because a lot of technologies enabling this journey towards a circular economy already exist. And the implementation at scales needs now acceleration. The design for recycling is a prerequisite to maximizing the recycling rates and the economic value in recycling. And the design for recycling is evidently already in the process of being implemented. And very important, chemical recycling, it's offering the missing piece of the puzzle on this journey towards um, circular economy. And what we have to do together is enable its acceleration to the market. Another part of the message which I want to pass in this uh, intervention is the fact that through determined value chain collaboration and putting together the joint expertise of those interested in driving the circular economy, we can open the way towards the enhanced economic value for recycling. This is what I had to share with you, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dana. That was that was great. I made a ton of notes <laughs> while you were speaking. I love the the collaboration in the group. And also the focus on being able to use that material in different processes. So you have the, based on different market conditions, you have the primary packaging, secondary packaging, chemical recycling. Um, really interesting, really interesting concept. So thank you. Um, now I would like to introduce Monica. Actually, before I do that, just a reminder to everybody that there is a, the questions on the right hand side of your screen where you can start to put those in at any time. Um, and we'll we'll cover them at the end of the, the discussion. So Monica Battistella from Tagleaf Industries. Monica has held several key positions at Tagleaf Industries across many functions, including sales and product management for TI Europe. With more than two years of experience, sorry, 20 years, not two, 20 years of experience in the industry and a keen understanding of sustainability and circular economy, Monica currently serves as a product and sustainability manager for Tagleaf Industries. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to be uh, with you today here. And what I'm going to do basically, I, uh, I will just reinforce the message that has been presented by Dana. We as uh, Tagleaf Industries are indeed part of, um, of CFLEX, so we are one of the stakeholders uh, who is actually engaged in all the work which, he has, which she has presented. So Dana has been discussing about industrial trials and she has also presented the result of those trials. 
which are absolutely an important step to validate the concept of the circular economy and what CPLEX is trying to do. So we are here today to talk about a mechanical recycling, of course, and specifically in, in our case, in the case of the company which I represent, the use of mechanical recycle content back into PP applications. So I go back again to the concept of what a mechanical recycling is all about, just to reinforce the concept that the final results, so whatever we, we need and we use, and uh, we also we need to, to bring back to the final application, which is in our case a polypropylene film produced in a specific uh, extrusion process, so both sides oriented. It's very much depending uh, on the engagement and on the fact that all the value chain is um, actively participating to the process. So it all starts, um, I mean, for each piece of the value chain, it starts when the consumer are buying the product and they are disposing correctly of the packaging. It starts from uh, the right collection systems, which needs to be implemented. So it, it, it is also needed that you have a, a proper um, sorting um, technique at disposal, so investments on the industry side. And then, uh, let's say, the value flex and the special protocol, which has been developed by, by C-Flex and specifically uh, by the work uh, which has been done uh, by Dana, is actually providing the right quality and the, the right level which is needed to progress. So this is uh, basically translated, this is a slide which is recalling uh, what Dana has, uh, has shown you, and it's uh, reinforcing the concept of uh, all the steps being very closely link linked together. So it's about being able to sort to the specific grades and uh, to sort them at uh, the right quality level, so PE and PP fraction, but it's also uh, even earlier than that, redesigning and then and designing your packaging having in mind what the end of life of that packaging is and that's something that is now supported by the guidelines which are available on the market so cplex has developed the specific guidelines actually to support the transition uh, towards the final uh, result and quality recycling of the same packaging what I'm going to, to introduce right now uh, is actually the result of the trials that we have carried out. There have been so far two different steps, two different trials, which have been carried out uh, with CPEX. The first one was actually uh, executed in August 2019, and that was uh, uh, on, a, on an industrial plant. And the second one took place last year, more or less this time in October last year, and it was on a pilot uh, on a pilot scale, but still um, very successful in both cases. And uh, we are very proud because the first trials back in August 2019 was indeed the very first trial and use of a PP coming from a mechanical recycling stream to be used back in a BOPP application. So what uh, we could achieve in terms of content of uh, PP um, mechanically recycled, as you can see here, starting from, let's say, the reference film, which in this case is shown with a zero uh, recycled content. So we could progress that by start by adding the uh, the recycle raising into the film, and we were able to achieve 16.2%. And then once all the parameters in the extrusion line were actually stable, we were able to go up, reaching 32.4%. So as a first trial, it was indeed uh, very uh, showing very, very good results, excellent results. And I have uh, to confirm and inform you that the same uh, target could be achieved even last year on the occasion of the second trials. This slide is showing you, uh, I'm sorry that it's not really um, well visible, but anyway, these are pictures which are actually taking as a reference uh, samples from the different uh, from the different reels which were produced. So starting from the from the top here where we have the film with 0% uh, of PCR content down to the last one, which is showing the 32.4%. So of course, when we consider the aesthetic aspects of the film, 
it was possible to see an increase in the number of spots and the number of gels, but that's quite uh, uh, to be um, to be understood, of course, because we are talking about uh, uh, a recycled content. But nonetheless, the, the aesthetics was really, really good, and I think you had the opportunity earlier to to see in in Dana's uh, presentation some of the pictures of the applications which were made, and actually the visual aspect. Uh, was really, really nice. This is showing exactly um, how the number of gels have incre increased starting from uh, the sample which is indicated with 0, 0.0 up to the sample which is called 2.2. .2. So by increasing the, the amount of recycled content, the number of spots and gels was to, to increase. But again, uh, as we said, it was not a parameter based on the, the assessment that we have carried out which really could, um, could uh, uh, let's say, interfere with the final use of the film or make it not suitable for the applications which are actually identified. Uh, above and on the top of the evaluations which were made on the aesthetics of the film itself, what we did were also some assessments on the mechanical properties because it is essential to understand not only the aesthetics, but also if um, the mechanical properties of the film will still make it suitable to go for the applications which we had identified. So if the film was suitable to be converted in terms of uh, printing, lamination, and then uh, subsequent use in the labeling machine, for instance, or other uh, packaging machines or pouch making machines. In this case, um, we had different samples. So starting from the zero sample, which is the reference one up to the 2.2 um, name samples, we see what is the performance in tensile strength both in machine direction and uh, transversal direction. And we do not see uh, you know, significant discrepancies which would uh, um, let us think that uh, the, the, the films with a mechanical recycle content would not be usable for the application. The same goes for the measurement of the elongation of brakes, so both in machine direction and transversal direction. You see, especially here, basically the lines that basically one next to the other. And then we had the elastic modulus. And so you see that there is quite a, a kind of um, fine tuning of, of all the samples, but being very close one to, to the other. The last point that we check and which was very significant and important for us was the treatment level. Uh, so we were thinking if you know the mechanical recycle content could or would somehow impact on uh, the properties of the surface when it comes to treatment, because treatment is a very important parameter in order to be able to convert the film, so to laminate, to print it. And so for us, it was very important to check not only the performance of the film right after the extrusion, but even we followed this parameter in months. And I can also confirm to you that uh, uh, well, I said that the first extrusion took place in August 2019, and then it was just before the COVID started. And for this reason, the, the, the trials, so the physical trials when it comes to printing and converting, uh, lamination, so they took place uh, longer. So they, they, they took place actually um, more than one year later. So they took place uh, towards the end of 2020, and some of them took place last year and still it was possible to reuse the film. So to print and laminate it and to make pouches out of it. So all in all, what could we identify um, for this film? So based on the assessment that we carried out, which are the assessment that we would normally carry out on all our portfolio, just to validate and make sure that the quality is fine, is okay, and is suitable for the father and subsequent converting step, we validated that hot tech and seal strength, there was no significant difference between material with recycled content and material with zero uh, recycled content. So based totally on, on fossil virgin uh, base material. Thermal shrinkage uh, dem demonstrated that even PCR material had somehow a slight positive impact on the film thermal shrinkage. 
the COF had no difference at all. So on the, when it comes to the performance, for instance, on the labeling machine, they were all successful. The, um, so uh, this film has been tested for wraparound applications and it has been tested by, by two brands and it was successful in both cases. And even when it comes to being puncture resistant, in this case also there was no significant influence of, uh, let's say, the presence of recycled content in the film itself. So uh, we, we came to the conclusion that this type of film is suitable, absolutely suitable, of course not for food contact applications, but it can actually uh, complete the need when it comes to the use of recycled material, is, and it can go in good combination with a chemical uh, recycled material. So uh, chemical recycled material to be focused and dedicated to food applications, and this option may, uh, of course, go for other applications where the food comp compliance is not required. So the test, as I have anticipated, have been carried out on wraparound applications. They have been um, they have been tested on pressure sensitive um, applications and also pouches. So um, all uh, have been carried out successfully. Some mock-ups will also be available at the next free show for the ones who will be visiting the, the exhibition. And uh, I hope that you will have the opportunity uh, to see them uh, physically. If not, uh, you know, some, some pictures are also available. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Again, I made many notes. <laughs> Um, I think about the design rules that are coming out through all of the plastics packs. I think those will be tremendously important. And also just making sure that we all align, um, that those plastic packs, the golden design rules are all matching. That's something I'm going to look into afterwards. Um, the second thing was the, the concept of aesthetics. I think that's something we all have to think about as consumers all the time is what we expect may need to change as we start to put more recycled content into our packaging. Um, the marketing guys or people that are on this call may not agree, <laughs> but I really want to change that here at Ice River. I often say function over aesthetic so that we can work towards more um, sustainable practices. And lastly, the interesting part we find when we implement sustainability practices is that it often leads to some environmental savings. And when you talked about that, that thermal shrinkage actually occurs at a higher rate we find that anytime there's a little bit of color, which you often have more color in recycled content than not, um, you actually save energy because that color attracts mm -hmm. heat. So very interesting. Um, very, thank you very much for your presentation. You're welcome. Okay, so next we have Romain Cazenave from Dow Packaging and Specialty Plastics. Romain joined Dow in 2002 in a commercial role in France and has since held several sales, marketing, and leadership roles for Dow's packaging and specialty plastics and coatings businesses across the Europe, Europe, Middle East, and African regions. He is currently leading the packaging marketing team for EMEA, including food and specialty packaging, industrial and consumer packaging, health and hygiene materials and adhesives, located in Hogan, Switzerland. Um, before assuming this role, he served as Sadara Solutions Product Director based in Singapore. So thank you, Romain. Thank you very much uh, for having us on, on this show. And I have noticed the same as you. Uh, the need of collaboration is really, uh, is really critical. And sorry, I'm going to repeat the same. Uh, you will see a lot of commonality uh, regarding uh, the need of collaboration. OK. Um, Accelerating flexible packaging circularities through design for recycling and how we can make sure that flexible packaging is part of um, the circular economy. We heard great story about PT bottle, uh, but it's not the entire market. We want to make sure that every single item uh, can achieve the same type of collection and recycling rate. So um, all strategic priority at Dow, protect the climate, stop the weight, close the loop. Uh, really, if, if you think about close the loop, um, we've made a very clear commitment by 2035, 100% of our products uh, sold into packaging application will be reusable application or recyclable application. And that's a very strong commitment and we will 
for sure deliver this, uh, this commitment ahead. Plastic perception. Do I need to spend time on here? You've seen it in the press again and again, and rightfully, there is a lot of pressure on the packaging industry because a lot of packaging are misplaced after usage. So it's really important that if we want to be a credible industry and we want to be able to speak about the value we bring to the society, the end of life of packaging needs to be tackled. And one important is that one life is not enough for packaging. We need to allow multiple life for packaging, either through reuse or recycling. We've got a five pillar strategy. The biggest one I will develop today is design for recycling, making sure that packaging is not a linear economy, but a part of a circular economy. The second pillar for us is mechanical recycling. You heard the work around CFLEX, how we can improve the quality of recycled material, both from design for recycling and also by improving the sorting, washing, and uh, recycling. Advanced recycling, also called chemical recycling, how you can take plastic and turn it back into a feedstock to produce virgin new plastic, displacing fossil feedstock by a circular feedstock, and with advanced recycling, there is no more limitation in terms of mechanical, optical, or food contact. Bio-based, same thing. We displace a fossil-based feedstock and we replace it with a plant-based. But here, let's be clear, there will be never compromise and never competition against human food. We are not here to fix the problem by creating a new one. We only focus our bio-feedstock from waste, or residue, never as comp never competing against human food. And finally, carbon. How can we decrease intensity of a process coming with new innovative process to produce the same molecule, but at much lower intensity? And a lot is happening here again. So today, I'm going to especially focus around design for recyclability. And benefit of challenge of flexible packaging. Flexible packaging, unbeatable, unbeatable in terms of efficiency. So that's the first P. It's, you can achieve a lot by using very little amount of material. You can see this echo pack. It's written very big, minus 78 plastic. You can achieve the same function with only 22% of the amount of plastic. And you can achieve all the function I mean the promotion, the protection, and the processability of the film through the value chain. And our goal is to achieve all this promotion, protection, processability, only using one type of polymer, polyethylene. Promotion, what do you need? You need the great optics, a shiny film, an appealing film. You want to keep the shape, the same brand appeal on the shelves that you have with traditional um, structure, but this only using polyethylene. Protection, food safety, just like um, all the subject, we will never ever compromise on food safety. So the protection you provide for the product, food, or even goods, because increasing damaged goods, if, if you, um, you, um, you wrongly design packaging, is totally um, a catastrophe for the environment because that's a lot of CO2 that will never benefit anybody that will uh, never uh, be used. And processability, that's the only all the point. What has been great about flexible packaging and why people have combined different type of polymers is to achieve this rigidity and this sealing performance. And how can you achieve this only with polyethylene? And that's exactly what I'm going to present on the new slide. So, Keeping the benefits of flexible packaging, being efficient, being um, appealing, protecting the content, and processing fast on the packaging line, only using polyethylene. The first one is orientation. Here I give the example of MDO, machine direction orientation, but we work on the same with B orientation, BOP by orientation of polyethylene. So what you do is you're gonna orient the polyethylene. 
um, around uh, five, six, seven hundred percent. And by doing this, what you do is you increase the stiffness of the film and you increase the optics of the film. And if you remember what I uh, mentioned before, we need to maintain all the property of flexible packaging while using only one material. Usually those, um, those uh, function was achieved using OPP, OPET or OPE, OPA, sorry. So polypropylene, polyester or polyamide. And here you can do and achieve the same function with oriented polyethylene laminated on a polyethylene film. And in this redesign structure, you see P plus P versus P plus others. So you can really imagine that the value of the waste you're going to generate is much higher. And instead of being a waste, you move from a waste to a resource for recyclers. So really what I want to insist, I'm, I'm, I'm coming, uh, I'm coming and I'm based from Europe. This is really a growing strategy, a growing trend. There is already more than 20 lines running in Europe. We've got customers buying already the second MDO line to uh, just to illustrate the success of this technology. And the same thing happened for BOP. So um, the OEMs have developed um, hybrid lines where the lines can switch from PP to PE and making sure that you choose the material of choice to, to, to be monomaterial. So that's processing and, uh, and promotion. Great opticals, great rigidity to run fast on the machine. So on the next slide, I would like to speak about collaboration. You heard it again and again, alone nobody can solve the issue, it's only through collaboration. And here, the idea is exactly the same. In here, it's replacing a uh, metallized oriented poly, uh, PET, metallized oriented polyester film with an oriented metallized polyethylene film. And again, you've got polyethylene laminated to polyethylene versus polyethylene to laminated to something else. So that was a great, um, a great challenge, but through collaboration with Bob's, with Alpine, with Elba, we were able to achieve this high barrier pouch. And here, not only you maintain the aesthetic, the processability of the film stings, optical properties and rigidity, but the food protection is ensured by adding a very high level of barrier. So really, we keep all the functions. We go for very demanding application in terms of barrier, only using one type of polymer, polyethylene and only it's possible through collaboration. This one is another uh, one. It's a commercial product um, that is available in, in the US. And so in this collaboration, we had a challenge to really keep um, this granola crispy. And we know that the enemy is uh, vapor transmission. A great one to achieve this is EDOH. But EDOH, when recycled, is forming some aggregates. And if you look at the center, you see that these little grinds and, and, and melt products are agglomerates of EDOH. And by adding a retain, which is a functional polymer, this retain ensure that this EDOH is, is, is really spread across the film during the recycling process. And you will boost the property of the recycled product in terms of optic and in terms of mechanical re uh, recycling. Here again, this, this is all about collaboration, collaboration with our customers, collaboration with the brands, but also collaboration with the retailers that are implementing drop-off uh, store uh, scheme where the flexible packaging can be collected. So you can ask how real all these technology are. First of all, I mentioned that 20 lines are running in Europe, but I've got even a sample here that you can find in, in a supermarket in, uh, in Europe. And really what I like about this one is you don't notice the difference. You get the same crispiness. I don't know if the sound can be heard. You've got the same optics and very important for us. When we went to the packaging converter, they mentioned that the printing was not affected at all same speed of printing and the pouch making speed was the same. 
So it's not about compromising neither for the consumer, for, but also for the entire value chain, making sure that at any step, the design for recycling is not creating an issue for somebody else down the value chain, making sure that your innovation gonna be implemented without hurting anybody. And of course, it, this, is, um, this is just the first step. As, as mentioned earlier, recycling, it's about design, it's about collection, it's about sorting, and finally recycling. Let's not forget every single step. We don't target to be recyclable, we target to be recycled. So collaboration through the value chain is really important. This would be my uh, final slide. Recycling is not no longer a nice to have, but a must have. Legislation is moving and moving fast. There is no time to lose and solutions are available. Solutions are available at scale. That's really what is important. It is not um, side project, lab project. These are real projects of full polyethylene product that can fulfill all, um, all the, the function. CA2 is a growing concern. Flexible packaging is the best option and now can be circular. If you go to a developing regions like in Southeast Asia, everything is flexible packaging. So as a country is entering into, um, into more uh, retail and consumer goods, they directly go for the most efficient technology. The rigid, the glass or uh, the can are kind of a heritage of the past. But if somebody is choosing a new technology, they directly go for flexible packaging for the reason I have explained before. Efficiency is unbeatable. You go to Africa, there is no landline. Everybody is having a cell phone. Why building an outdated uh, technology when you can have a more modern one? Last point, solution are ready, and we are here to collaborate. This is really a call to collaboration with everybody within the value chain to make sure that every single packaging is becoming recyclable, is collected, is sorted, and finally recycled. No more waste, just resources for another person within the value chain. Thank you very much. Thank you, Romain. Um, again, uh, I have my notes <laughs> that I'll go over. So first, I love that concept of one life is not enough for plastics packaging. That's a really good quote. I like that one. Um, secondly, brands are so important to this. Um, I found when we started with PET, once we got one brand to accept the product and allow it out onto the market, everybody else joined. And that really built, yeah, you got the ball rolling. The snowball effect, the snowball effect. Exactly, exactly. Um, third, nothing's really proprietary anymore. I feel like there's a lot of collaboration. When we put in our flexible film line in 2018, we, had, we still have lots of people helping us to leapfrog ahead and get to the point. So I think our goal this year is 30% recycled content, um, but a lot of help from bigger players in the industry, smaller players, whoever whoever's around. And then finally, that concept, paying attention to the CO2 is so important. Um, as we see a lot of, of movement towards paper products, my concern is always, you know, plastics were brought here for a reason to allow us to keep those trees standing. So um, plastics play a big role in reducing our carbon footprint. And I think that's important to remember. So thank yeah. you so much, Lamet. And uh, we are now going to move on to questions. So we have approximately 15 minutes for questions at this time. During, uh, so you can remind the audience, or sorry, <laughs> I'm going to remind the audience that we have 15 minutes. Now I have to scroll up here to find the first question. So question one is for Dana. Do C-Flex effect efforts focus on household flexible packaging or both commercial and industrial and residential packaging? Uh, good question. Yes, we are focusing on household collective flexible packaging. In other words, the most difficult to recycle. Okay. Um, second question is also for Dana. 
what would be needed on the design side, design for mechanical versus chemical recycling to enable the flexibility of outputs you described? Another good question. Um, and uh, I'm gonna uh, have an answer which uh, might surprise some of you in the audience, but we came to realize in CFLEX that design guidelines would not be different between mechanical and chemical recycling because a good material which is properly designed to enable recycling would have to be as much monomaterial as possible with as little contamination of other polymers as possible. Fundamentally, the difference between mechanical and chemical recycling is in the fact that um, in chemical recycling, you can have a mix of polyolefins, polyethylene and polypropylene, and have a perfect yield um, and very good material as outcome uh, from, from the chemical recycling process. While in mechanical recycling with a mix of polyolefins, you cannot target uh, film applications, you, you have to target injection molding. So uh, they are both recyclable, but at different type of qualities. So they, they end up, sorry, so they, they end up in, the, in a different market. Is, yes, is they saying. end up, but, but the very short answer to the question is, we need design for recycling and there is not a big difference between enabling design for mechanical recycling and enabling design for chemical recycling. That, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Monica. What was the source of RPP used in the applications you described, i.e. flexibles collected from household or CNI? They were trials from CFLUX, so it was household. Actually, specifically, I can mention uh, what we call here in Europe the yellow bean. You know? the yellow bean uh, or bags, this were the collection of plastic in many countries in Europe, Germany, for instance, in Italy as well. So, household waste. And that's why uh, the trials were very significant and successfully. And you know, the final meeting was even more important because of this. Okay. So this next one, um, how does C-Flex or any, anybody else deal with multi-material laminates? Uh, maybe I answer uh, because it's directed to C-Flex. So um, multi-material are in the scope of the design guidelines uh, which are being currently developed. Um, the first priority is redesign multi-material laminates as much as possible into monomaterial or compatible combinations of polyethylene, polypropylene, so polyolefins. Um, however, there are uh, coming technologies, emerging technologies, which uh, will enable a better recycling for those structures which cannot be redesigned from multi-material to monomaterial. And I mentioned in here sorting technologies, like, uh, for instance, the uh, watermarking technology or um, uh, separation technologies like lamination, um, delamination, sorry, uh, which should enable um, treatment, end-of-life treatment for multi-materials. However, these are emerging, not yet mainstream. It will take time to make them applicable for the circular economy. Um, if I may jump in, just yes, use yes. monomaterial. You can laminate uh, polyethylene on BOP or on MDO and, and get monomaterial. Yes, uh, the same in the case of polypropylene. I think every, every stakeholder who's engaged either in PE or PP is trying to provide and to you know to widen the portfolio so that we can allow our customers to to actually have a PP based or PE based solutions to improve then exactly on what we have been discussing today. So the quality of the final recyclate. Okay, well, thank you. 
Uh, we have some technical questions for Roma. Um, is MDO, PE, and PE film effectively monomaterial? Recycled material from these packages can be used back in packaging with what with that mix of PE molecules? That's uh, indeed quite uh, quite technical, but uh, we did uh, we did run some trial of uh, of those structure and we used those recycled materials um, into a uh, new film. So we made um, a pouch uh, containing 30% of recycled material coming from those type of pouch. So um, yes, uh, when you've got mono material, you can produce a recycled product that can be used back into a pouch. Um, so really uh, what is important, it's not about downcycling, but recycling flexible packaging back to flexible packaging that said um, you cannot get food contact um, if uh, you recycle the product uh, that's uh, that's not permitted for the time being okay and kind of along the same line how is metallized pe consistent with circularity uh, the amount of metallization um, is extremely extremely low so the, the content of metal uh, or sometimes even allox um, are uh, not changing the weight of the packaging. It's so, so little that um, it's not affecting. It will affect the color, just like an ink, but it will not affect the mechanical property of the film. Okay. Um, again, uh, lamination, MDPE, PE, MET, OPE, PE, need to use special lamination adhesive or can use same as one being used on the structures that are being redesigned? Uh, we have not developed any specific adhesive because we've got a adhesive portfolio and we have used our current adhesive. So um, I cannot be too generic, but uh, we have not faced any uh, challenges regarding uh, the, the um, lamination of those films. So, um, uh, Again, that's another thing that needs to be validated. And that was important for us, that it was valid through the value chain. It's the film extrusion, the printing, and the lamination. And here with uh, the packaging converter we've been working on, there was no compromise, neither on the efficiency or the performance of the film. OK. And um, the final technical question so far is, what effects might the retain compatibilizer have in material that goes through multiple recycling cycles? Um, so the retain as a specific function is to functionalize and compatibilize a product that normally are not uh, compatible. So if, if you've got polyethylene and EVOH when you recycled and there is high level of EVOH, you've got a quality of recycle that goes down while with retain you ensure that the EVOH is evenly spread across all recycled material and 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 you improve the quality of the recycled material okay um it, this one is for anybody so in the next five years will we see pcr film in direct contact with food products are eu health and environment ministries collaborating on this objective who wants to start uh not five years i don't believe it will be five years um, that said there is a lot of work on uh, recycling decontamination i saw some question regarding others uh de-inking there is a lot a lot of innovation um but for food contact uh i believe that the for the next from now till at least 10 years chemical recycling will be the only option not mechanical recycling pt can i, think... I give this because you've got a, a very well-defined stream. And uh, at least in Europe, to be food contact, you need to prove that 95% of your waste is food contact. And with flexible packaging, this type of traceability is not possible. So until then, um, we have to support the industry through secondary packaging, right? <laughs> uh, and and And... I want to be clear, there is, we never oppose mechanical and chemical recycling. There is a room for mechanical recycling. There is also a market for chemical recycling. For food contact application, chemical recycling is, is the solution. Uh, same for pharma application. 
but um, uh, as, as, as I mentioned, we can move from, let's say, um, a, a food pouch into a detergent pouch with mechanical recycling. Um, and and uh, let's, let's, um, let's make sure that we use what is needed um, and, and the lowest possible um, uh, energy intensive solution. Okay, Monica or Dana, do you want to add anything? Yes, I'd like just to, to, to confirm what uh, Roman has just said about, you know, the, the, the presence of uh, many technologies about the inking, about the lamination. So there's a, if we see in the last two years what has been done, it's, it's incredible. And uh, I think that there are even more technologies like, you know, Holygray, for instance, which are trying somehow to trace. And people start thinking about Holy Grail as a potential tool, actually, to start thinking about uh, separating what is good contact uh, to, you know, to what is not good contact. Uh, maybe, you know, five years time, it's too short to think about a possible implementation of all these technologies together to, to make it happen. But surely, uh, as time goes by, it could be, why not? You know, it's uh, not, not something for a, a short uh, term. Uh, not in medium term either, but in 10 years time, uh, I kind of think that technology will be as much as as it is, as it is now. Probably it will be, you know, 10 times more than it is today. Right. Dana? Um, I, I absolutely agree with what has been said. I would only um, express it a slightly different saying five years, for food contact from mechanical recycling, it's a ambitious stretch objective. Worse, keep it an objective, but realistically, it will take more time. It will come because innovation in the contamination would enable it, but it requires more time. And we should not um, deviate our attention from enabling chemical recycling to be realized fast. Okay, so um, just going back to that question, do you feel that the EU health and environment ministries are collaborating on that objective? Huh, tricky it's question. that they are monitoring that, huh? It's a very tricky question, but I would say um, a little bit more support would be welcome. Okay. Um, next one is for Monica. What's the impact of odor and how do you deal with it? Uh, this is a, a good one. Um, I think that uh, we have a witness here because Dana was actually present when we had the first extrusion. And one of the first things which uh, we, are, we were quite impressed of was uh, the fact that we were expecting a lot of odor during the extrusion of you know whole pp with the recycled content but it was not the case and what we did we uh, actually made a kind of a panel test after the extrusion we kept samples of the finished uh, um, so the you know eight four samples from uh, the reels which had been extruded along with uh, traditional standard uh, fossil based and virgin material produced um, um, films uh, to compare so for for the panel for the panel task people to compare and uh, they could not you know detect uh, such difference but even in production so in where the extrusion line was uh, was based we we could not detect uh, such a difference but again this is a lot to do with the fantastic job uh, and the protocol which has been developed so it's not like the standard material we get from from any recyclers huh? so that that material that we got was really um had been prepared for our application so to go back into an extrusion application with special deodorization special filtration uh, special washing and so, yeah, the answer is very much in that tiny details. Okay, so, okay. Um, question for Dana. Is contamination such as non-intentionally added substances a huge concern for recycling? Yes, contamination is always a concern. Um, and this is exactly what makes it so difficult to um, generate the data which would demonstrate food contact. Um, and uh, 
you know, the only in, very interesting thing, um, more I, I dig into it, more amazed I am each time, is the fact that, you know, if you look at mechanical recyclers, they talk about packaging waste in terms of type of packaging, almost like a shape, a 3D shape. Chemical recycling, they talk about what molecules they are in that waste. So all these substances which are non-intended and might um, interfere with the uh, chemical recycling process are of um, higher concern than they could be, for instance, for the mechanical recyclers. Okay, well, thank you. This one is for Rome. We lost you there for a second. You're back. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> you talked about keeping design and texture of the packaging. What about pricing? Is it more expensive? Um, that's a very valid question. And, and uh, I have to say that um, oriented polyethylene is a rather new technology um, that is trying to, uh, to displace a very mature technology that has been improved for years and years and years. So yes, uh, right now we um, oriented P is not at the same uh, cost level than oriented P or, or uh, oriented PP or oriented polyester. But what is important to know is um, this is the cost of the film. Afterwards, you will, you need to take into consideration the EPRCs, which is a growing subject, the extended producer responsibility, and and the man, uh, and the mandates of some retailers like um tesco is very clear if you go on their website they, 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 they clearly indicate what is acceptable and not acceptable the brands have made the same commitment so um yes the cost um the cost uh currently are higher but are declining as as uh, maturity is, is going um during k um you will see a new mdo line which a much bigger output um same thing with uh, BOP, uh, those lines are, are giant line uh, with annual capacity between 20 and 30,000 metric ton a year. So you can expect the cost will, will decline over the years. Okay, we definitely see EPR, um, environmental pricing, stewardship fees really spreading globally. <laughs> We're definitely feeling it in Canada right now. Um, now this next question is for anyone. When would a brand converter or brand or converter choose MDOPE or BOPE? This one is, is MDO. Um, uh, um, I think um, uh, MDO started first. So the technical maturity is higher than BOPE. And, and after both technology will have room. Uh, we tend to see a slightly higher stiffness with MDO versus BOPE. Uh, the optical properties of BOP are really amazing. Um, so um, this will be uh, some, uh, some technical choice, but both um, are available um, in industrial scale, at, at industrial scale. Okay, Monica or Dana, anything to add to that? I think it's for Monica, the question more. Well, you know, as I said, uh, we, we are all uh, engaged in providing solutions for, for the brands, so they, they are looking uh, for the solutions based on the current multi-material laminates that they have. You know, there are applications uh, which you need to, let's say, to, um, to design based on the performance, which can be on the packaging machine, which can be based on the all the, um, all the supply chain where the product, uh, you need to use the final product. So if you have to export, if you know that it's going to be managed. So each material is actually responding to a specific need, which is then defined by the packaging machine and is defined by the life itself of the package. So it's really based on, on what is the need of the, of, the, of the brand. I wouldn't say that it's a matter of price. It's a matter of, first of all, the protection of the content and how you make sure that the, the content is protected based on maybe on your, you know, the pack machine, packaging machines that you already have, or if you uh, are going to, to have an export market for that material or, you know. So there are different, uh, different parameters that you need to consider. What PP and PE producers are doing are trying to make an offer and to make sure that the portfolio is actually meeting those needs at the best. 
Okay. Um, so we received a few questions about collection technologies, uh, which was the topic of our previous webinar. But we'll see if our speakers have any thoughts on the following points. Um, we encourage participants to, to check our previous webinar resources on the left-hand side of your screen. How do you envision FPP getting collected from households and sorted from other materials so further processing and end use is possible? Who would like to start that one? I, I can. Uh, so I, okay. Donna, oh. you can go, you can go. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was about to refer to one position uh, paper which we released uh, probably a year ago on this, uh, in which we're clearly stating that the need is to collect flexible packaging um, through a separate collection with all flexibles. Uh, by saying this, we also recognize that in some countries or in some parts of some countries, um, the residual collection is preferred because of more logistics or, or um, setup type of considerations. But the best for recycling is a separate collection um, in which flexible packaging will be together with all uh, plastic or all dry recyclables. Romain or Monica? Yeah, I agree. I totally agree because uh, based on you know investigations, workshops which have been carried out even within CFLEX, uh, this has been demonstrated, which is which is the way. And we see what's happening with PET bottles, for instance. You know, when you have the deposit return system, you have specifically that that stream, that collection is very pure, very clean. So. There's a, there's a lot of work uh, to be done, but the path is uh, signed and clear. In Canada, our, our country is so vast and spread out that it, it's tough to do um, special sortation. Really, the single stream seems to be what functions best here. So I hope that works <laughs> for flexible collection. Um, okay, so last question. What is needed for mechanical recycling and chemical recycling to work in complementary, not complete, uh, not compete for feedstock? Maybe we'll start with first Roman. Of all, first of all, I, I believe price will be a great incentive. Um, uh, today, if you look at the price of um, of uh, waste, uh, um, how could I care, a bale of PT bottle, that's that's very high because there is a lot of demand. So I think some quality will find a way to mechanical recycling, and that will be higher quality waste priced, uh, priced higher, the lower quality that cannot really attract um, mechanical recyclers will be directed to chemical recycling. So uh, clearly today, the most valuable one are PT bottles, HDP bottles, but if you take industrial films, those are also highly valued type of waste that will not be a suited, uh, suitable um, feedstock for chemical recycling just on the cost basis. So um, it's, it's, there is a, this one. And then the brands also are putting pressure. When we speak about chemical recycling, they are specifically, specifically mentioning, can you ensure that the waste you're gonna use is not diverted from mechanical recycling. So um, that's, um, that would be my, my answer to those. I would add to this that the prerequisite is that all packaging, all flexible packaging is collected. And then it becomes available through sorting for the right type of recycling. And I really liked uh, your intervention, uh, Roman, because at the end of the day, it's going to be the market dynamics, the free market dynamics, which will direct each material towards its right use because it will be pulled by the market demand. Okay, thank you. So um, at this point, we are going to ask if there's any more questions. If you can get them in there quickly um, and we'll see if we've received any. And then the next step is to then go to the poll. 
So right-hand side of your screen, you can click on pull. Um, and I believe tech support will take us through that. Oh, we have another question, perhaps during the poll. So are European MRFs currently sorting and producing PP flexible bales? Are there currently commercially operating PP flexible mechanical processors? Short answer, yes, for both. Yeah, country specific. Country specific? It's not, it's not across Europe, it's depending on the country. But uh, market signals could change that, right? Exactly. And, and it's, it's, it's really what is important, design for recycling, meaning monomaterial, so that the waste you're going to produce is going to be of interest for somebody else. Then collection, making sure that all flexible packaging is collected, sorting, sorting the different quality, mono PP, mono P, and then recycling. Recycling is the last step, but let's not forget all the steps and all the stores that needs to be aligned in, uh, in order to achieve the circularity goal. Thank you. Anybody else want to add to that or? Okay, so I just wanna thank Dana, Monica and Rome for joining us today. We have people from around the world joining from many different sectors, different countries. We thank you for your time. And I hope that this was as valuable for everybody watching as it was for me. It was very interesting. The presentations and recordings will continue to be available on the webinar site. We will be posting an announcement on the project's LinkedIn site about the last webinar on the series that will feature alternative recovery technologies and techniques and look forward to your participation again. So the poll is running. Thank you, everyone. So we see some answers coming into the poll. If you could take the time to answer that for us, that would be very beneficial. So thank you to those who have already done it. How would you value the webinar in terms of relevance and newly acquired knowledge? There's three questions. This one will be closed in 30 seconds. So the final question, what other information would you be seeking on flexible plastics in the future? This is very valuable to the team, if you could answer this one. And thank you everybody for your time. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful day.